No, what was over here? Uh, a jungle. Uh, what did they call it? Little Vietnam. But I never appreciated nobody coming to Vietnam because I lived it here. There were civil rights leaders. They were leaders in the civil rights movement, but then there were also leaders for civil rights on the ground in their own communities. And I don't think anybody personifies that better than Eva Davis. My house was firebombed and shot up. Me, a woman with 11 children in my family, and I didn't run, I stayed here. They would be the equivalent to a Black Lives Matter or to an Occupy movement from the 70s and 80s. Just think of me being an old black country woman running from that situation. You know, a lot of people said, oh, it's just, you know, people raising hell in the projects. You know, they don't know what they're talking about. These folks don't have anything to say or to offer society. And to the contrary. East Lake would not have been here because people would have gave up. Any one of the women that we've talked about and others could easily have been um, the first woman mayor of Atlanta. They had that much skill. They just didn't have the opportunity. All these women, I, I think a Janetta Coach called She Rose, all of these women uh, who, who, who paved the way. So we're entering now the villages of East Lake, which is known as the New East Lake, formerly East Lake Meadows. And we're gonna walk over here to the pavilion, which holds a little history, and I wanna share a little nugget of history with you regarding Eva Davis's legacy. <laughs> this piece here, if you will take a look, the bricks are a bit of red clay. We know Georgia's known for red clay, but this right here is totally different from the bricks that you see that enhanced throughout the, that are enhanced in the buildings throughout the property. But we chose to keep this as a momentum. These are original bricks from East Lake Meadows and um, my grandmother wanted to make sure we kept a piece of the foundation from the old to the new. You always want a piece of history to remind where you've been and always thankful for where you've been to show where you're going. So if you come up here, this is, again, it shows you where she wanted to recognize all of the partners and all of the residents, all of the city leaders, um, former uh, President Jimmy Carter and mayors and board members and all of the honorees that had some hand in this because it takes a village and she knew that. Eva Davis in East Atlanta was a partner with Tom Cousins and Renee Glover um, in developing what is now known as the Purpose Built Communities Model or the East Lake Model that ensures that low income people, people who are living in public housing, as well as others who are at the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder, are part of not only the outcome of community development, but also the planning and development of that plan. Uh, and she went on to be a, a member of the Atlanta Housing Authority Board and a very strong voice uh, for uh, transformation and innovation in public housing. I first met Ms. Davis um, in 1995 when I went to work for the Atlanta Housing Authority. I had been a private practice real estate lawyer and left there and joined the Housing Authority to become the lawyer who would help create the legal and financial model to do what we now call mixed income housing. And I had an opportunity to go out to Eastlake just a couple of weeks after I joined uh, the Housing Authority and the first person I met was Eva Davis. And she was strong and fierce and brilliant and uh, nobody's fool. And Miss Davis wanted change, but she wasn't gonna let anybody take advantage uh, of her or the people in her community. Yeah, I was intimidated by Miss Davis when I first met her. I mean, she was a physical presence. She was a physical leader. When, when she walked into the room, you knew that Miss Davis was the leader. Um, she ran all the 
planning committee meetings, she was a very skilled facilitator of meetings. So she had an agenda every week. She knew who was going to speak when. Um, she knew what she wanted to accomplish every day. So she was, I mean, she was a, a person in her own. I mean, a, you know, that, that expression, a man in his own. She was a woman in her own. And she was, uh, as I said, strong and fearless and, um, you know, really just a, a strong leader. My grandmother was an only child, and she was born and raised in Crawfordville, Georgia, and her mother um, was a cotton picker. Um, so my grandmother was raised by a sheriff and his wife because her mother was sent off to work in the fields. Um, so she grew up an only child, um, and I think that was her motivation for just wanting something different and to see something different than what she'd already seen. She's a mother of eight um, and moved to Atlanta with her eight kids and raised her eight kids and then began raising some of their kids, which that would include me. She raised me from the time that I was two weeks old until I was 17, a senior in high school. So she was my mom. Miss Davis was the president. I always call her Miss Davis. She'd call me and say, uh, baby, this is Eva. But I'd always say, hi, Miss Davis, because that's how I first knew her. And um, it was a, uh, something, a title of respect and affection. Um, but Miss Davis um, was the president of the East Lake Meadows Tenants Association and had been since it was formed almost 40 years before then. Um, and she was a really skilled leader in the community. Uh, she was an effective advocate for the people in her neighborhood. She tried to get the resources and the things that people needed in order to have a better life. But fundamentally, the infrastructure of the neighborhood was not designed to allow people to be successful. Um, the housing had not been well built. In fact, the housing had, when it was opened very quickly, it became clear that it had been done on the cheap, that the pipes that took the effluent out of apartments were inadequate for the family sizes who were in apartments, so immediately sewage started backing up. Um, there hadn't been, you know, grass um, on, on the property. It was just um, poorly designed, poorly developed, and poorly managed. And so Miss Davis had always had a dream. She'd say, baby, I had a dream in 1974 that our community was integrated, um, that we had people of different incomes living here, that we had grass for kids to play on, and that it was just like a regular neighborhood. And, and I think that's what she really wanted to be able to do, to create a great neighborhood that included, in a, in a true and authentic way, a place for people who were poor and African American to be able to live side by side with other people, so we were all just people in a way that would allow the children of all of us to be able to move forward and reach our full potential. But she didn't have the ability to do that on her own, and she needed allies. And I think Renee Glover at the Atlanta Housing Authority and I became her allies there. Um, Tom Cousins and Greg Giornelli at the Eastlake Foundation became her allies. And that doesn't mean it was easy or that it didn't take a lot of time to build trust and that, that we always agreed on everything, but we agreed on enough of the big things that we could work through the small things. She was always one that preached, give people their flowers while they're living. And I think we as her family and the community did at the time, what we knew to do and as much as we could do. But beyond that, I have been very thankful to be in the path of others who saw my vision to carry on and honor her because at the end of the day, she could have left East Lake and just fend for her, her family. Um, it would be the easy thing to do, but she was not one to take the easy route. So she could have left and minded her own business like people suggested and just said, hey, you know, why make this happen? Why fight for this? Um, but she just wanted better and she just fought for better. And, you know, sometimes it was a challenge because it affected our, our, our way of living because our apartment was firebombed twice because they did not want to see this happen. Um, and it was basically trying to shut her up. Um, leave well enough alone. We're, we're not, we don't want it. We don't, 
think it should happen. Um, but she still, again, saw beyond those measures to say, I'm still going to fight, I'm not going anywhere. And she, she stood the fight, uh, she didn't back down, and she carried it out. Ms. Davis made a lot of sacrifices for her community. Um, her house was firebombed several times because of her advocacy to create community change, to try to stop the drug boys from taking over the community. Um, they were the ones who had an economic incentive to keep things as they were because organized crime thrives in chaos. And East Lake Meadows was chaotic at that point in time. She did a lot of involvement outside of East Lake. She uh, was involved in uh, welfare rights for women. Um, she was in, um, involved in civil rights for um, just the city of Atlanta for poor low-income families where she was involved in voter registration drives uh, with Joseph Boone. She marched with Joseph Laurie, um, Abernathy, um, uh, Congressman Lewis, just very involved, Hosea Williams. So she was very well connected as far as her service and when they called she was always uh, one of the partners that was eager to help because there just needed to be fairness um, and that's what she wanted to create, fairness and opportunity across for low-income families. She really, she was involved in the lawsuit that um, uh, was filed against Atlanta Public Schools to integrate Atlanta Public Schools. In fact, she worked for Margie Pitts Hames, who was one of the lawyers involved in that suit. And for lawyers my age, Margie Pitts Hames was an idol. She was one of the, the leaders, one of the first really effective uh, women lawyers in Atlanta who was advocating for social justice and change. So um, she, Ms. Davis was right there by her side. Uh, Ms. Davis was involved in lots of important things, um, whether it was the Atlanta, um, uh, segre segregation or segregation lawsuit, uh, whether it was making sure the Housing Authority was doing what it needed to do, whether she was advocating for other public agencies to do a better job at serving East Lake Meadows, she was out there. And she was a, a leader amongst the public housing residents who were also leaders in the civil rights movement. Uh, people like Mary Sanford out in Perry Homes or Louise Watley at Carver Homes or uh, Susie Laborde. I mean, these are all really important women who were the engines, as I said, of the civil rights movement. There may have been a male hood ornament, but let me tell you, the engine was all female. It was one day where they were doing um, welfare rights marches um, and she would always get a group of residents and we were kids of course so no babysitter um, so we went in strollers and there were several parents there with strollers but they we were on Capitol Avenue um, and they came out and arrested um, the whole group for picketing. They wanted the group gone, but they locked up everybody, kids in the strollers, the parents, everybody. But of course they would never stick. We'd be released hours later, but it was her point um, in making sure that whatever needed to be done so that the voices could be heard and people could take notice, then she was willing to sacrifice that. And I'm proud of being a part of the council because I could have took off and been gone. I didn't have to stay. But God put me here to serve. Ms. Davis was the master of communications and a television age. She could come up with a sound bite. She used to say, we tore down hell, we built heaven, and now we're living in paradise. I could never have come up with something like that. I don't know that I could have paid anybody to come up with something like that, but that was her authentic way of processing what we've done and her ability to communicate so other people would understand very quickly. I mean, how few words is that and what a strong message it is. You know, the, the old East Lake Meadows was, had its reputation for undesirable behaviors. And that kind of overshadowed the whole legacy of there were decent people living there. There were normal families, working families, just trying to survive and do what they needed to do because they were dealt circumstances but trying to overcome those and she was one of them. She just chose to take a different stance to say, not only will I fight for my family, but I'll fight, fight for all of our families. So I think when change is presented, it makes people nervous. And I think it made a lot of people nervous. And then you also have it where if you have people who don't want to go to work, 
and who don't want to make a productive living, but be, they do it another way creatively. That wasn't so welcome to clean things up, if you know what I'm saying. I think Ms. Davis's vision has been accomplished in this community in large part through her um, significant leadership and her commitment to seeing this through from, from day one. Um, in a neighborhood that had a crime rate that was 18 times the national average, uh, where uh, average incomes were about $4,500 for a family, where only about 13% of adults worked, um, we together planned for about two and a half years how to revitalize this community in a way that would rebuild the infrastructure to create a new platform for families to work their way up and out of poverty, and that's happening. So if you look now, fast forward almost 25 years from when we started, um, everybody works in Eastlake unless they're elderly or disabled. Um, and the families who continue to receive public housing assistance, their incomes are five times higher than when we first started. People have transitioned from relying on government assistance for income to actually earned income. Um, we've got uh, one of the highest performing schools in Atlanta, Drew Charter School, serves about 1,900 little geniuses from four years through 12th grade now. I wish Ms. Davis were here to see the full-blown service to the children she advocated for over the years and to see that we've dedicated our boardroom to her. I never saw an, any inkling of fear in Eva Davis and I think she knew in her heart she was everybody's equal and even if she had not had a lot of education she could go you know, toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody in any kind of difficult conversation. She was as smart as they be, they, anybody could be. In fact, um, she, was, she became a member of the Atlanta Housing Authority Board during the revitalization, and it was really at one of our hardest times when she had been appointed to the board. And um, um, Renee and I were both skeptical that this was a good thing. And I will tell you, Eva Davis was a model board member. She did all the reading. She came to every board meeting prepared. Um, she taught the other board members how to be a good board member um, because by both the kinds of questions she asked, the good hard questions she asked, um, her understanding of fiduciary duty, and her ability to move the agenda forward. Um, I mean, she was just remarkable. She, even though she had not had a, enough education, um, um, she could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody. In fact, Shirley Franklin has often said that had Eva Davis been born in a slightly different place and time, she would have been the first African-American woman president of a major American city. Her legacy is being a visionary to want something and thinking outside of the box when it probably wasn't on people's radar. She was always thinking ahead, very forthcoming and thinking, I have people coming behind me. I need to make room and make a way for them. So it's kind of paying it forward of knowing that someone's coming behind me where the opportunity and the resources all need to be made available because that wasn't always the case. So her legacy, I would say, was she just wanted better for families to have a even playing field to be able to be productive citizens. Just wanted to give them opportunity. Ms. Davis's legacy runs throughout that neighborhood and now beyond through purpose-built communities. Um, within Eastlake, um, she's everywhere. The uh, boardroom at Drew Charter School is the Eva Davis boardroom. Uh, recently, Eastlake Boulevard was renamed Eva Davis Way. Um, there's a, a room at the YMCA named after Eva Davis. Uh, she, she is everywhere. She's been part of this community. Her, her blood runs through it. What you see now here is all mixed income housing where her vision was always to have people just mix because not because of income um, and economic status, but because of a neighborhood. She always wanted a neighborhood where people had homes and wanted to have a safe, sanitary, affordable living experience that they could call home and to have everyone um, mixed where it doesn't matter if you're paying a dollar or if you're paying a thousand dollars, that you all could live in harmony and live in, in, in a neighborhood that was 
um, what you could call home. So that's what we have today. They considered what was right, what was going to be good for the people that they represented and for the entire city. Um, they didn't think about fear and they didn't think about courage. This is just who they were. They're incredible role models for how women and people can lead from whatever position that they're in. And that's important. I mean, a lot of people look to elected leadership and that's fine, but the leadership in a community has to come from all over. With me not being raised by my mom, you know, she took me in and I can tell you, she gave me every tool that a parent or a mother should give their child. And those were lessons in watching her to, even if you were standing alone, and it's always not popular to do the right thing, you may end up standing alone. She was willing to stand alone. And that's what I learned. I think her legacy is, and people say she was tough, she was determined to do the right thing, even if it meant I'll only have a few, because she believed that quality was way over, it was way more necessary than, than quantity. And that's what I do admire about her. That I think her legacy is, you know, and that was even in the Bible, where you may have an army um, of a lot, but everybody may not show up and God gave them a few and they fought off millions. So I think she was, she was that person for me. I learned that leadership comes in all shapes and sizes and colors and genders, and it all doesn't look alike. Um, my life before that had been in the private practice of law, which was dominated by white men. And there were really very few models of female leadership that I saw in that world. And, and I was really hungry for that. And so when I watched Eva Davis in action and then got to know her up close and personal, I saw her own brand of leadership that she had developed that was authentic to her, that, was, uh, that she knew how to use all the levers of change that she had within her power to get done what she wanted to get done. And oftentimes she didn't have many levers. So she had, to, she had to be smarter than everybody else because she had to get done what she wanted to get done with fewer um, resources and fewer uh, levers. While she had built relationships with people like Jimmy Carter and John Lewis and every mayor in Atlanta, um, she still didn't have all the ability to pull every lever that you think of rich white people being able to pull. So she had to be smarter and better in order to be able to get done what she wanted to get done. And I think she was. Any one of the women that we've talked about and others could easily have been um, the first woman mayor of Atlanta. They had that much skill. They just didn't have the opportunity. The circumstances weren't there. So I was ever, forever humbled in their presence and humbled in their memory because I know that I had opportunities that they did not have, all kinds of opportunities. Had an opportunity to go to college, had an opportunity to go to graduate school, had an opportunity to be a stay-at-home mom, had an opportunity to run for office, I had an opportunity to serve as mayor of the city, to continue to have a voice around politics and civic issues. Um, and I'm invited in because of the positions that I've held. Sometimes they had to force their way in. They had to show up and say, I'm here, and I'm here to speak on behalf of this group or this issue. And they weren't invited. That takes a different kind of stamina and self-confidence. And I am forever grateful for their leadership. And I think Atlanta, uh, the city of Atlanta, is a better place that they have both lived and served and fought for rights for women, but more importantly, white rights for everyone, for their families, for children, for neighborhoods. All of these women uh, who, who, who paved the way who paved the way. I mean, we, although we're talking locally here in Atlanta, certainly one can generalize to the nation as a whole in terms of the work of women. But certainly talking about Atlanta here, yeah, you do get a Stacey Abrams, you get a, you can get a Shirley Franklin, right? Uh, and a Keisha Lance Bottoms benefiting from the work of these women. I think the lesson is wherever you are, you can make a difference. You know, Dr. King says everybody can be great because everybody can serve. 
and, and I think the women uh, like Ms. Davis are evidence of that. And while we individually may feel like we've not much power or influence, we have more than we think. And if we raise our voices, tell our stories, connect with other people, uh, we can make a difference uh, even one at a time. So this area here that we see used to be a big red dirt field, just full of glass um, and bull, uh, bullet sh uh, shell casings and trash and we'd have community day. Come up here and clean it off and we'd have kickball and a field day for the community. It belonged to a convenience store owner across the street that we called Pop but my grandmother was good friends with him and got him to donate all of this land as a piece of it because of he wanted to see the vision for the villages. So uh, Pop donated his land here and um, he retired and of course that store is gone but this was donated and it used to be play, like a play uh, piece of land for our community. I think it is important to have um, monuments and markers named for the courageous people in the community. Uh, so I think all of that is fine. I think we need to tell their stories and teach their stories and to keep their legacy alive generation to generation. There's something to be said for passing down the stories of history. We have film, we have audio, we have written, um, stories. I think that's important. And I think we need to tell their stories in the context of the American stories and in the context of Atlanta and Georgia stories. Women gonna rule the world before the world come to an end. Thanks for watching. Go to aibtv.com forward slash donate to support programming like this. Your contributions may be tax deductible.